He's everywhere in today's papers, an admiring quote in The Sun from one of Labour's leading thinkers, a dire warning about the risk of ignoring him from a leading Conservative campaigner. He's even in a cartoon, smiling contentedly from the shrubbery as David Cameron and George Osborne sink into austerity quicksand. He is Nigel Farage, MEP, and the party he leads, UKIP, is ending the year on something of a high, thanks not least to finishing second in a parliamentary by-election. Mr Farage has his eye on Westminster, with a promise to contest every seat at the next general election. As part of our series of interviews on the state of the political parties at year's end, we'll speak to Mr Farage in a moment. First, our political correspondent Chris Mason has been assessing UKIP's performance. Whichever way you look at it, UKIP is on the rise. We are beginning to become the party of opposition in the north of England. Nigel Farage has always revelled in the performance that comes with being on the political stage. And recently he's had the opportunity to relish a more prominent role, more than just that of an extra occasionally allowed to speak. We've just heard the UKIP leader's reaction to a second place finish in the Rotherham by-election in November. Political success brings media exposure and he's making the most of it. In the past few weeks, he's exploited divisions within the Conservative Party on issues such as gay marriage. What you can say over the last six months is we have established ourselves now, currently, as the third force in British politics. Can you really say that? Well, we've beaten the Lib Dems in all forms of elections over the course of this year. UKIP has had a good year in the court of public opinion. Andrew Hawkins is the chairman of the polling firm Comres. 2012 has been a, a, a very good year in the in both the polls that matter and the polls that don't. And the polls that don't are the, the, the sort of polls that companies like ours do uh, for newspapers and, and others. And their vote share has crept up. In the polls that matter, by elections, they're also doing well. They have been in second or third place in five out of the, the previous 12 by-elections. Second, though, ultimately, is first loser in our first-past-the-post electoral system. Nigel Farage can point to Rotherham and make his big claims, but others might point to UKIP's performance in the Croydon North by-election on the same day. There, they barely scraped enough votes to recover their deposit. The party still has no MPs at Westminster and Andrew Hawkins says that is a fundamental problem. In order to truly be the third force in British politics, the third party, they've got to start uh, taking seats in Westminster like the Green Party have. So what explains UKIP's boost in popularity over the last 12 months? In part, it's down to circumstance. With the Liberal Democrats in government, they're no longer hoovering up protest votes. UKIP can sweep up those voters who fancy none of the above. But according to UKIP's deputy leader Paul Nuttall, Mr Farage has made genuine progress by broadening the party's appeal. It's not just about pulling out of the European Union. We stand for grammar schools, We none of the other political parties do. We want a firm but fair immigration policy. None of the other political parties do. They're almost in favour of a two-tier immigration policy whereby the, you open the door to Eastern Europe but you discriminate against people who aren't from Europe. We don't want that at all. We believe in zero tolerance on crime. We don't want to see cuts to the defence budget and we want to see major cuts to the foreign aid budget. So these are things which the other political parties don't stand for. So it's a distinctive manifesto. Paul Nuttall believes the party membership, which he says passed 20,000 in the last few weeks, is being boosted by that broader range of policies. It's a point recognised by Oliver Neville, the new 21-year-old chairman of Young Independence. He's not much bothered by European Parliament elections. The EU is a sort of a a sideshow, an attraction. It's good Obviously, Nigel gets fantastic YouTube hits with his speeches in the Parliament, but if we want to make a difference, it's in Westminster politics. Another distinctive domestic policy can be found in Mr Farage's opposition to same-sex marriage. He said this would convince even more Conservatives to switch to UKIP. He might be right, but a party with more policies has more internal disagreements. Oliver Neville again. Pushing for gay marriage, which is something I'm a, a big supporter of, it's one of the few things I think this government is doing right. So I think that there's definitely a more socially liberal side of young independence, I think that's a really good thing. Part of Nigel Farage's challenge in 2013 will be to keep the momentum while holding the party together. In other words, now that UKIP's in the limelight, can the party handle the glare? Discipline has always been a weak spot. It's something of an occupational hazard for Mr Farage that every so often he has to disown party members who've said stuff some distance from the official UKIP line. Paul Nuttall says the party's next big challenge will come in the spring. Next year it's the county council elections out in the shires, areas which people think 
should be good for UKIP and we'll be putting up hopefully a full slate of candidates and I think we can create a bit of a political earthquake next year in the local elections and I would use that as a barometer to see whether we're up to it or not. Winning the European elections in 2014 is the party's medium term target and then winning seats at the general election the next one but getting bigger puts greater pressure on the party's limited backroom infrastructure and will bring a greater scrutiny that the party will have to respond to with confidence. Chris Mason reporting Nigel Farage is in our radio car now. Mr Farage, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, You've announced plans to field candidates in all 650 constituencies at the next general election. To what purpose? Oh, we want to give people a choice, a real, genuine choice. I mean, firstly, of course, we believe that Westminster should be the place where our laws are made, uh, and in reality, 75% of our laws actually come to us through the institutions of the European Union. But, you know, the party isn't, as Paul Nuttall said in your package, the party isn't just about who governs Britain, though that point is vital. It's about how that Britain should be governed. And people out there who are saying in opinion polls that they support UKIP deserve the opportunity to go out and vote for us. You've got a membership, what, something over 19,000, maybe up to 20,000. That would mean, uh, on one estimate, about one in every 30 of your party members running for office as an MP- MP? Do you think that's feasible? Yes, but I mean... Have you got that kind well, of quality I, of membership? No disrespect to those people who are members of the party, well, but you wouldn't necessarily well, see that proportion of members from uh, some of the other big UK-wide parties. Well, well, you say big UK-wide parties. I mean, the Conservative Party membership has halved since Mr Cameron was leader. Um, I think the Liberal Democrats are down now to 36,000 members. So right across the board, you've got falling party memberships. We may at the moment be few in number, but we're much, much higher in quality than we've ever been before. And we did field nearly 500 people last time around two and a half years ago. Indeed, and there's always the question of the cost of that and whether perhaps you're spreading yourself too thinly if, as a party, you want to influence what happens at Westminster. You're not going to form a government at the next election is this the right approach well you could have said that to the lib dems for the last 90 years uh, because they haven't won an election since before the first world war uh, we i mean look what we've got but to exactly do it's taken them that often- long Yeah, what we've got to do is offer people choice uh, by being on the ballot paper, but then what we have to do, and this is part of the professionalisation of UKIP, and it doesn't come straight into a general election, it has to build up through district, county and unitary authority elections, is we have to start winning local representation. And once you do that in an area, and you hold a cluster of seats at local government level, then the perception, when a general election comes, is that you've got a chance in that constituency, and if people think that, then you have. So we, in many ways, have to do what the Lib Dems did through the 1990s. They focused very aggressively on the right target seats, and they started, once they built up local government bases, to win more seats in Parliament. Isn't the practical difficulty, though, for you, that the Lib Dem strategy, if that is indeed what you're adopting, took about 20 years from the late 80s until 2010 when they ended up in coalition with the Conservatives? But Britain's relationship with Europe is going to be decided long before then. Shouldn't your strategy be much more short-term? Well... No, I think actually what's happening is that events are moving so quickly. I mean, just look at 2012. We started the year off on an average of 4.5% in the opinion polls, which in fact, by our historical standards, was very good. And we finished the year uh, with an average of the, of the recent polls over 10% and one in a Sunday newspaper yesterday as high as 15 You're, you're a sensible things... enough politician to know, though, that polls are not necessarily a measure of support when people go to the ballot box. And you have to take, a, a... You have to take a range, don't you, rather than picking out... It's perfectly natural and understandable. Yeah. You want to pick out the big, successful polls. But no, I mean, I, you have I, to I, measure I... performance. And your performance has not been consistent. We saw in Rotherman, you came second. We saw in Croydon, as uh, Chris was pointing out, you nearly lost your deposit. Yeah, well, you've, and you've forgotten that we came second in Middlesbrough as well. Uh, and in fact, those I haven't gone It's just an example. But uh, the point is, your sport is not consistent across the country. And if you're going to have a strategy that's based on being a national political party, that causes you problems. Political events are moving very, very quickly. All the old established ideas that had dominated politics for the last couple of decades, namely that we had to build wind turbines everywhere because of global warming, that EU membership was a good thing, that immigration was benefiting Britain, all of those basic assumptions that the whole political class have supported are changing. Okay, and I let, think me, let me ask the reason, you. The reason, 
that, that were up in 2012 is that our issues, which were considered marginal, are now mainstream, <laughs> and that in 2013, the, uh, those arguments will become even stronger. OK, let me ask you about a couple of those issues. You are, um, as you say, not just a party about Europe, but Europe is clearly an important part of, of your appeal. Uh, the Union of European Federalists uh, reported to be proposing in the new year that Britain could have associate membership, still able to take advantage of the single market, but no MEPs and no say in the European Council. Not dissimilar, actually, to what happens in Norway at the moment. Does that appeal to UKIP? No. I mean, I don't want us to be part of a customs union that prohibits us from making our own trade deals with the rest of the world. So you don't want even to be part of the single market, as far, from your point of view? Oh, Lord, no. I mean, the single market, that's where we get open-door immigration. That's what we have to pay £50 million a day for as a membership fee. The single market... I mean, what is happening here is, from Mr Cameron across through Mr Miliband, everybody accepts that we can't sign the new European Treaty and that we're not going to join the Euro. They're all now gathering around around the single market, just as they did the common market exactly 40 years ago. And we want Britain to trade with Europe, to be friendly with Europe, what, but not to be constrained by European law. What then would you say to John Cridland, Director General of the CBI, who said today that, bluntly, as he put it, we pack a bigger punch in securing trade deals inside the EU than outside trying to do it on our own? Is that the same CBI that said 10 years ago Britain should join the euro? As far as I'm concerned, they are utterly discredited, and I'm not interested in what Mr Cridland has to say. You don't think the view of business matters? The view of business matters, but not the CBI. The CBI represent the giant multinationals. Uh, the people that run them tend to be more like senior civil servants than entrepreneurs. And if you look at the Institute of Directors, if you look at the Federation of Small Businesses, and through those two organisations, you're covering 80% of the employment in this country, you get a very different view. You have a range of policies, uh, not least uh, on issues like crime and education, supporting, for example, the, re the restoration of grammar schools, um, scrapping the European arrest warrant, doubling prison places to enforce zero tolerance on crime. Where would you get the money from? Uh, well, of course, we have to save money, and uh, the deficit is the one thing that we haven't talked about. Clearly, leaving the European Union saves you £50 million a day. Cutting back on the foreign aid budget, as Paul Nuttall mentioned earlier, they're just the start. But what we've really got to get to grips with is the massive growth in the quangos in this country. Sure, but Many it, of them, from what I can see, doing very little good okay, but that's, at all. That, are you suggesting that they could fund something as big as a, a prison building programme? About £170,000 per place per prison, their average cost of construction. At the moment, the Ministry of Justice's capital spending has been cut by 50%. I mean, these are very ambitious plans, but are they yeah. realistic? Uh, there is much evidence, actually, that if you take a slightly higher percentage of recidivist criminals and you actually put them away for longer, the cost of building the prison um, is very, very soon saved by the cost of time in policing, courtroom and everything else. So spend now and save later? On that, yes. But, I mean, look, we can't get away from one basic thing, and that is that we as a country, we as a, you know, our government is spending far more than it's earning every single year, um, and it is up to us to put forward um, a much more radical programme than we have thus far as to how government spending can be cut. Nigel Farage, leader of UKIP, thanks very much for joining us.